Hello. Oh, there we go. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Lauren. Again, that's me. Hi! Oh, sorry, I have a microphone. That was loud. Uh, anyway, I'm happy to introduce for the first time ever at Skepticon the Godless Perverts. All right, so you got your mic on? Uh, I'll know in a second. Testing, what's three? Testing, 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 testing. <laughs> Testing, can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. It's and can you hear me now? Can we all be heard together? Hello, everybody. Hello, Skepticon. How's it going out there? So as, as they said, this is Godless Pervert Story Hour. And what, may you ask, is Godless Pervert Story Hour? And how did it come about? How did Godless Pervert Story Hour come about, David? It's a fascinating tale, Greta. Yes. <laughs> um, it started at, I think, uh, well, it started at San Francisco Airport, where all kinds of magical things happen every day. Um, uh, Greta and I were sitting there and wondering over the fact, I think we were on our way to... We were on our way to Secular Student Alliance Conference. Secular Student Alliance Conference, right. We were uh, there talking and marveling at the fact that here we are, two atheist activists, and we're both, so both erotica writers. So what can we do with that? <laughs> you know, you've got your chocolate, my peanut butter, you've got my peanut butter and chocolate. And next thing you know, we realize we should really get these things together. Um, and this is what we have done. So uh, we've created a literary event in San Francisco that meets, what would you say, once a quarter? Yeah, about well, three, four times a year. Whenever the sexiness gets sexy enough. And um, we get a group of about, you know, between five and 10 writers at the Center for Sex and Culture in San Francisco, Carol Queen's Center for Sex and Culture. Love you, Carol. Um, and uh, we're going to give you a, a taste of that tonight. Um, the, the topics are always heretic-friendly erotica or sexed-up atheist rants. <laughs> and the intersection of those two things is what Godless Pervert Story Hour is all about. So are you ready, Godless Nation? Uh, Woo! Okay. Uh, so just a few quick ground rules before we get started. Uh, ground rule number one, this event is about sex. Yeah, it is. Uh, this event is explicitly about sex oh, with yeah. explicit descriptions of sex. If you are under 18, please hang up now. Uh, if you're under 18, you can't be here. We don't care how sophisticated you are. We don't care how great your sex education is. We don't care if your parents think it's fine that you're here. Actually, we care about all that. We think that's fabulous, but you still can't be here. This event is for adults only. So go ahead and drink or something. I don't, <laughs> don't tell the miners to drink. Don't drink. No, go, no, go have a no, malt. No. Go have a malt and be in bed by ten. Responsibly. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Number two, this event is about sex. Um, it is explicitly about sex. We are there are going to be descriptions and depictions of very explicitly of sex, nonfiction such as essays and memoirs and stuff, and fiction, i.e., porn. It's a um, there is, this is porn night uh, at Skepticon yeah. uh, and the porn hour and there may be, there's going to be very explicit depictions using explicit language and there may be depictions and descriptions of sex that is un varieties of sex that's unsettling to some people, sexual situations that are unsettling to some people, sexual themes, sexual language that's unsettling to some people. If you don't want to be here for that, now would be an excellent time to leave. We support you in that. And if at any point in the evening you don't want to be here for that, we support you. We will not think less of you. We will actually think more of you because we like people who are good at setting boundaries. Yes. Number three, and this is the last one before we get started with the smut. Um, this event is about sex. <laughs> However, attendance at this event does not imply sexual consent. Mm. There's pretty much one thing that implies sexual consent, and that is somebody saying, yes, I would like to have sex with you. And next, actually, I don't think that counts as implied, does it? No, um, uh, the fact that people are at this event does not mean they want to have sex with anybody at all or with you in particular. So please respect the people sitting next to you, respect the other people at the event. Uh, if you're going to hit on them, do so uh, in a nice, respectful, consensual way. Who is here, by the way, is at Mary's the thing Where's on? Mary? Yeah, Mary? That was follow awesome. her guidelines on yes. how to hit at people, hit on people at conferences. Yes. And uh, our first reader is the lovely and charming David Fitzgerald, who I am going to introduce. Lovely and talented. David Fitzgerald has been called the Ferris Bueller of San Francisco. Uh, he is also, oh, uh, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, he is, among other things, the Secular Student Alliance RCO, Regional 
campus organizer. Campus organizer for California and Nevada, action coordinator for San Francisco Atheists, co-founder of the world's first atheist film festival, and with Greta Christina and Chris Hall, the Godless Pervert Story Hour and the Godless Pervert Social Club. He is also a historical researcher and the author of Nailed and the Complete Heretic's Guide to Western Religion. Uh, he also writes sexy, heretic-friendly erotica under the name Kilt Kilt Patrick. Damn, is he sexy, David Fitzgerald. Woohoo! Thank you, Greta. Is this lavalier mic picking me up? Can you hear me way in the cheap seats up there? All right. This is a story that is from the book Under the Kilt, which may still be available for purchase in the merchandise table if it hasn't been hunted to extinction. Um, this particular story is called Later Days Saints, and it's a story of a young Berkeley co-ed, Sabrina, who one day is visited at her place in Berkeley by two Mormon missionaries, and Satan makes it seem right in her eyes to seduce them. <laughs> I'll just read a little bits and pieces of it to get the sexy going. It starts like this. I know, I know, this is the part where I go straight to hell, but honestly, can you blame me? Are you trying to tell me you would have done the same thing in my place? Bitch, you're such a liar. Skip a little bit. She meets these two hunky Mormon missionaries and then tells her friend, so they do the whole, hi, we're from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and we're in your neighborhood today to share with you the blah, blah, blah spiel. And I say, hey, I'm Sabrina, and I'm all, wow, that's great, come on in, like I'd never heard of such an amazing undertaking before. Really? Another testament of Jesus Christ? Well, the whole time I'm already concocting my evil plan to jump their bones. I've never attempted such a crazy combo maneuver, the high-level religious depancing and the simultaneous double seduction. It's unheard of, never been done. I feel like an Olympic athlete. I focus accordingly. First hurdle, I'm still holding the straight guy, girl's guide to sleeping with chicks, real book incidentally, in my hands. Uh, gotta lose that, so I use my ninja skills to stash it under the throw pillow fast, like a reverse pickpocket. Score. It's a good thing I'm just back from class with a professor I want to impress, because I'm not dressed in anything too riot girl or hippie chick, and I'm not loafing around in my uber comfy Cal Berkeley sweatshirt nighty and grizzly bear slippers. In fact, I'm totally rocking the smart, studious co-ed look. My hair's in its ponytail, and I'm wearing my naughty librarian glasses and a super cute pink short sleeve button-up blouse that hides the Celtic triple spiral tattoo on my shoulder. I'm in the jeans that make my legs look long and my butt irresistible without being slutty about it. I'm not even wearing my lucky thong, just unpretentious fuchsia panties from JC Penney's. I snap open the top button on my blouse on the sly and turn down Katy Perry before she starts in about kissing a girl and liking it. The whole time I'm quickly scanning the room for anything else potentially incriminating. Luckily I straightened up recently, wow, timing really is everything, so there's no sex toys, porn, or uppity feminist slash godless slash science reading material in sight. The only potential giveaway of my dangerous inner nature is a small poster of Eleanor Roosevelt with her and my motto, do one thing every day that scares you. Can do, Eleanor, baby. <laughs> okay, so now I'm thinking where to hold our uplifting little chat. The bedroom's right out, the couch is tempting but too forward, so the wobbly little table in the dining room it is. Dreamy elder steward takes the lead, wait, walking me through the intros of his little blue book of Mormon. I nod and make polite interest noises while he tells me how in 1830-something, upstate New York, the prophet Joseph Smith, who I swear looks just like a young James Spader in a cravat, gets the scoop from the angel Moroni that all other religions are bullshit, I'm paraphrasing, and really displeasing to the Lord. Tell me why angels of the Lord always appear to prophets in remote, secluded locales instead of God just telling everybody? Or why a God would wait until the friggin' 1830s to get it right? But whatever. Bite your tongue and stick to the plan already, Sabrina. So the boys take turns telling me how Joseph Smith translated golden plates using the magic Uma Thurman stones or something. It all sounded very Harry Potter, to be honest. I'm plotting while they go on about Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthoods, celestial, terrestrial, and telestial heavens. The three witnesses who vouched for all this and eight other witnesses who vouched for them. And then if we prayerfully sought answers from our Heavenly Father, he would give us a burning in our bosom so that we might know the truth. Trademark. My eyes are glazing over a little, so I review my options. I've never been one for the in-your-face wanton sex goddess approach. Screw this made-up bullshit, boys. Let's fuck. And I'm pretty sure they'd bolt in terror if I tried. And I'm not nearly glam enough to pull off the femme fatale, simply staring them into drooling lustful submission, Marlena Dietrich style. So I'm half listening to their talk of lost Israelite tribes escaping the Tower of Babel, sailing to the New World, and because of their sin, turning into American Indians. I know, right? 
But really, I'm in my default nice girl seduction mode, leaning in close, feigning rapt interest, laughing at anything remotely resembling a joke, and taking an opportunity for innocent, accidental bumping of elbows and touching hands. But damn my inner anthropology major. Even while my panties were growling, were calling the shots, <laughs> even while my panties were calling the shots, my spoil sport brain still couldn't keep from butting in with stupid questions and nearly queering the whole deal. Though, in my defense, there was a lot of snickering to suppress. All the pictures of the Nephites and the Lamanites were pretty gay. The models all looked like Conan the Barbarian and Ancient America looked like a Dungeons and Dragons convention. So I decided to drop the innocent seeker approach and shift to a different strategy, the saucy challenging opponent. Wait, it really says these guys had steel swords and silk togas and chariots and elephants in America over 2,000 years ago? And that millions of them were killed in, in upstate New York? I'm genuinely puzzled. Oh yes, they nod. My appalled inner archeologist comes out swinging. But has anybody ever found any of these battlefield sites or steel artifacts or elephant bones? And you realize there are no horses to pull their chariots or silkworms outside of China in 600 BC, right? They squirm a little and promise to locate a good book on Mormon archeology span for me that will clear up the matter. Believe me, this back and forth goes on for fucking ever. And every two minutes, I'm sure I've overplayed my hand and they're gonna storm out all offended any second now, but they stick it out. Oh, so finally I say, hey, if Joseph Smith translated it, why is it in King James English? They smile kind of nervously and say something about it being a very accurate translation from reformed Egyptian, whatever the hell that is. But by now I think even they are feeling a little shaky about their answers. And honestly, I tried not to be too harsh, but hey, after all, they were the ones who came knocking on my door, right? I swear I wasn't a total biatch about it though. I don't even bring up polygamy even once. Seems like a cheap shot. And I'm completely set to grip, cheerfully grit my teeth through any talk of how many babies good Mormon women are expected to pop out. And all my good-natured sparring aside, I've got my diplomacy hat on. I keep things super friendly and take careful track of any encouraging signs. And signs are good. Both guys seem to like the closeness when we accidentally bump up against each other by accident. I'm very scrupulous to accidentally touch both of them very equally. And I totally love that both are being so careful not to be caught staring down my top, even though their eyes keep being drawn to my forbidden goodies within. Excellent. When I accidentally contemplate out loud that it would be easy enough to check if American Indians and Jews were related with DNA evidence, they turn a little pale. And that's when I think, okay, cool it, Brainiac. Time to switch from bad cop to good cop, pronto. Uh, hey, can I get you guys something to drink? Oh, just water's fine, thank you. Coming right up. I adjust my jeans ever so tightly as I head off to the kitchen just to give them something to think about. So get this, I pop out again with two glasses of orange juice and then I stop and make a dough face. Oh shoot, you guys said water, didn't you? What was I thinking? Are you guys even allowed to drink Sunny D? Oh, sure they assured me. Because I can take these back. If, oh, no, that's fine. Everybody drinks juice, right? Okay, then. I roll my eyes and stick my tongue out a little, shake my head. Oh, what a silly goof I am. We all have a good laugh and they drink up. Mmm, good. Let me skip a little bit further down. We talk some more, mostly about small stuff, nothing churchy or deep. They just want to know how I liked UC Berkeley and what I was studying, what I like to do, stuff like that. That's really nice, but the whole time I'm getting so fucking horny that I'm sure they can hear my pussy growling. And I start visualizing the next phase of Operation Double Horn Dog. I flirt with a damsel in distress tactic. I'd fake a massive Charlie horse, groin pulsey, and then they'd have to carry me over to the couch. I'd lie down and have them elevate my leg. Here, Aiden, could you stand over there and massage my thigh? It really hurts. Yeah, just cradle my leg in your crotch, just like that, yes. And Cameron, can you lean over and rub my neck and shoulders? No, wait, I guess it's really my ribs and pecs that hurt. Just lean over and yes, that's it. Oh, Aiden, I don't mean for my foot to be kneading your privates like that. It's just an involuntary muscle relax. Cameron, your tie's in my face. Here, let me get that for you. We're still chatting and I just about have this whole damsel thing mapped out and wonder if I can really pull it off when suddenly I have this ultra mind-boggling triple epiphany. It starts when they said something about having to go visit so many houses in a day, and I start to make up some total bullshit like, oh, I wouldn't go bother worrying about the rest of the neighborhood. They're all Baptists and Hare Krishnas. No need to waste your time hunting there. And then whammo, I realize, hey, these guys have been here for over two hours already. They've totally blown their day's schedule. And then it hits me, wait a sec, they've got to have strict rules against male missionaries visiting unmarried young girls unchaperoned or something. I realize, these guys have already told breaking their rules. And once I realize all that, I get this incredible, bright, shining, beautiful burst of transcendent certainty. I can totally do this. 
These two gorgeous men children want to be seduced. I know it with a deep divine burning in my bosom. I am so gonna nail both of these Mormon boys. But I have to, but you know, I, have, I gotta say, for all my plotting and conniving, it was humbly, downright and miraculous, really, how simple it was. At this perfect pause in the conversation, I just suddenly zen like, no, it's time. I stand up, pull my glasses off and my scrunchie out, letting my hair grow wild and free. Voila, schoolgirl to sex goddess, just like that. I give them a look and a smile and reach over and take them by both their neckties. Come on, I say, leading my captives back toward the couch. And amazingly, they do. Should I keep going? I sink into the couch and pull them down after me. For a second they just look at me, all nervous and excited, not quite sure what to do next. I keep a firm grip on their neckties and look from one to the other. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. I finish on Cameron and draw him in for a long, big, wet kiss. It's everything I'd hope for from that luscious mouth. Then I turn to Aiden and reel him in for his chance. Oh yes, two for two. Mmm, happy Sabrina. I lounge between them like this, taking turns, pulling them in for deep, yummy tongue kisses back and forth. I'm so impressed with how well the boys share. They stroke my legs and arms while they wait their turn. It feels so good. I think I'd just be dandy if this could go on for just a few more hours. But then they start nuzzling my neck from both sides and that feels so amazing, I totally lose it. Lose my grip on their ties. I give them both a little free range and wrap my arms around them. I grab big handfuls of their hair and they each start rubbing a breast. I enjoy that for a minute and then I go up and work my way out from under and tell them to let me stand up for a sec. I was gonna give them a strip tease, but I feel a little dizzy and decide it'll be more fun to have them do the work anyway. I have them unbutton my blouse. I make Aiden start at the top and Cameron at the bottom. Then I do the honors of unhooking my bra. The look on their faces is priceless. I lower myself toward them and wind up sitting on my knees on the couch and hanging onto it so they can each get at my boobs. Damn, I feel just like a mother goddess with the two of them each having a mouthful of me. I know I had to stay in charge and not give any puritanical Mormony impulses a chance to raise their ugly heads. I push them off for a sec, unsnap the fly, and slither out of my jeans as sexy as I can manage. My panties are soaked, but it feels exhilarating as hell to stand there for a moment with my thumbs tucked in them and my hips cocked while they sit there all dazed in their geek squad shirts and ties, looking up at me worshipfully. I peel off my panties and kick them away, then giving my, uh, give my adoring congregation a little twirl to show off my ass. Since I started with Cam last time, it seems only fair to give Aiden first crack this round. I flop down on the couch and order him to get on his knees in front of me. Then I reach down between my legs to grab his, his tie like a dog leash. This is a fun game. And pull him face first into my wet little love trap. Go on, get busy, I growl. Then I look over at Cameron and say, come here, pretty boy. I snatch his tie too and pull him down for some more frenching. I have to break it off after a little bit to give Aiden some, a few pointers. It really was his first time going down on a girl. He has good instincts though and picked it right up. God, yes. I shudder up my first orgasm right there. It's been a long time coming, but fuck me, so worth the wait. It's unreal having Cam snog me and caress the girls while Aiden is partying up downtown. I keep my right hand buried in Aiden's hair and reach over to the front of Cam's slacks with the left. I run my palm down the stiff bulge there, mmm, nice, and then slip it down, through, and hook around to totally cop a feel of that sweet little butt of his. Another minute of that, and then I make him switch places. Tough, but fair. Cam doesn't disappoint on his oral exam either, and I'm all over Aiden's junk like it was a braille book. It feels high time to raise the nudity quotient in the house. So I take my tongue out of Aiden's mouth and bring Cam up for air. I get them in close so I can let them in on a little secret. Listen up. I put vodka in your orange drink. Can you feel all that alcohol working in your bloodstream, making you drunk and restless? Reckless? You're in trouble now, aren't you? You've totally fallen into my sinful trap. Their eyes get wider, but it looks like everything thus far has overwhelmed the verbal half of their brains, or male brains, as well as their moral centers. I snake my hands down to crest their cocks to their trousers. And tonight, you're gonna do what I tell you, aren't you? They shoot anxious looks at each other. Don't look at him, look at me. I wanna hear you say it. First Cameron, then Aiden croak out, yes. Yes, what, I glare. We're going to do what you say. God, they even stammer in unison. I'll leave that for now. That was from Under the Kilt. The story is called Later Days, Saints. All right, our next reader 
Hina Dadaboy is a 20-something graduate of fine University of California institution with a BA in English and another in philosophy. She spent her childhood as a practicing Muslim who would never in her right mind have believed that she would grow up to be an atheist, feminist, secular humanist, or in other words, a skeptic. Currently, she self-identifies mostly as a dorky nerd with a geek streak, but also as a polyamorous pansexual switch and feels that the first set of descriptors is hardly unrelated to the rest. Hina Dadaboy, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> That's the one. Oh, no, that one. That one. Yeah. All righty, good evening. Quite a big perverted crowd. This is a good thing. <laughs> now, David's introduction did a pretty good job of telling you a little bit about my past, but though I was always a rather horny bitch of a female human being, I wasn't always the shoulder and leg bearing, long lash daring red glove wearing brazen hussy that you see here before you today. <laughs> I was a whole lot more than that and a whole lot less than that. I was a good little Muslim girl keeping her desires in check though her cunt was always a little kind of wet because there was always someone attractive enough around to keep her stomach wound in knots trying to keep the feeling from sinking lower down in her body. It didn't really work so well. So instead, I used my left hand to crawl down, lower slowly down my body, and then up into something. Mm. Why the left when I'm a righty? Why would that happen? The left is the dirty hand, of course, not yeah. the dominant one. The one I used to clean myself after using the bathroom, the one I used to spend way too much time with <laughs> cleaning myself in the bathroom. <laughs> At some point, it did occur to me that I could save the earth and stop wasting water by doing it in bed or in the shower. I, I heard it felt better with the other hand, in my case, the dominant hand, but instead of getting me wetter, it just felt clumsy. All was not lost, though. I was well prepared for the series of lovers I had, at least at first, in my sex life. One of them wanted me to wear my headscarf to bed. Mm. Afterwards, he asked me how it had felt. Warm. It felt too damn warm, which meant I was cranky. It was not hot. I was mostly annoyed by it. Others were not so subtle in the, revealing to me their weird exotic fetishes about me. I thought it would end when I devailed. I thought I took the headscarf off and those assholes that walk up to me and say, I bet you're a total freak under that thing, ah. would disappear would be gone. Um, instead, instead I found weirdos who approached me with a, hey, can you teach me the Kama Sutra? <laughs> so in honor of these brazen men, who are more brazen than even I am as a, the brazen hussy you see here today, I have written in the great tradition of the romantic and the pastoral, where decidedly urban types affect what they think is the speaking style of the rural people in the country. In that great, very Western tradition, I have for you tonight a sort of pastoral plea to an idealized lady. We move from imaginary verdant fields to a desiccated wasteland. Such an empty wasteland that the place fills up with these men's mirages that they dream up. It's a new Agrabah for the sort of mind incapable of empathizing with other human beings. So to symbolize my transformation into the men I'm paying homage to, I take my gloves off. I'm so sorry you had your genitals mutilated, your womanhood desecrated by a knife. I think you were fated for, nay, that you deserve a better life. The women around here are getting a little unwomanly for my taste. Why don't you wiggle your womanly curves over here and make haste to move here where we men are much more merciful to our women? Dear Muslima, come and be my wife. We let women here keep their clits and wear their skirts with slits all the way up to here. They get to walk and drive and their heads are bare for us men to admire and boy do we admire them. We let them know with our words and our gestures. It's not disrespectful, I promise. 
Don't let those absurd feminists pollute you. Don't let them dilute your pure womanly instincts with their words. Your untouched skin is like coffee with cream. I've been dreaming of touching something different from the pasty white flour dough so common here. Sourdough, all of it. Not appreciating a nice guy like me, a good man like me. I hear you people like them light-skinned, so maybe you and your grateful sisters could trade places with these ungrateful bitches. Then maybe they'd learn. That would show them. Their faces are all dour from all that feminism that they've been swallowing. That, that, that feminism keeps them from doing what would please us, which is kneeling like you do, but ending it with swallowing. I'm sorry, dear Muslima. Was that too sensual for you? Poor dear, don't fret. Please come here. Let me whisper softer things more softly into your innocent ear. I hope the garment enveloping you, keeping your beauty hidden away just for me. I hope the cloth is thin enough for you to hear my passion, but thick enough to filter out anything too rough for that virgin curve of yours. You'll learn soon enough how to be free. It will be my utmost pleasure and duty to teach you exactly how to be free. Come here, my dear dusky beauty. Let me do my manly duty and save you from that oppression you so abhor and take you to a place where you can show off. Your face is just the start. But, but not too much, of course. You'll end up yet another American prude whore whining about rape culture, a vulture dining on dead sexism that clearly doesn't exist at all anymore, especially in comparison to your people and what we had here before. But, but enough about those prude whores. Will you, my sheltered pearl, lady ensconced away in a tower, will you let down your hair from your cloth and free yourself? It's all right. Let down your hair so you can climb up to my blindingly bright freedom. Now, now the nymph, as per tradition in these pastoral odes, has a reply, and she's not a nymph. She's not a mythical creature. She's a human woman. She's a human female brain being. And here's what she has to say. Your white savior complex doesn't make you any less creepy than the other creeps. When you see my past, you see an exotic desert land, and you are seeing a desert, all right, but it's called California. I'm sorry if that's too goddamn prosaic for you. Your avatar, Last Samurai, Ace Ventura 2, when nature calls fuck, the exotic chick game is played, and it's played out. You think you're the first one to shout, hey, baby, where are you from? A cunt. Same as where you came from. Same as what you won't be getting from this. You think white American women use you for your wallet? Try a mail order bride. That's what she wants. You're just falling for the same tricks women play to get by and sometimes maybe even get ahead in this patriarchy game. It's just a gift horse in a style that you've never seen before. You're too afraid to look it in the foreign mouth and see women crouching inside. Women have no wheels, you think. You'll take advantage of the submission they're broken into by their cultures, you think. They'll be so grateful, you assume. I'm not some virgin waiting for your dick to make me a whore, but exclusively for you. So unless you have something to say to me, about me, and not about some desert mirage your bored brain cooked up, all this is something you can look at, but you can't touch. Thank you. There we go. Who we got? Oh, you're gonna like this. Greta Christina is the author of Why Are You Atheists So Angry? 99 Things That Piss Off the Godless, a book you can find right there and really should because it's an awesome, awesome book. She's also the author of Bending, Dirty, Kinky Stories About Pain, Power, Religion, Unicorns, and More. She's not kidding. It's available on ebook and audiobook, read by the author, print edition on its way. She's currently working hard on her next book, Coming Out Atheist, How to Do It, How to Help Each Other, and Why. She's the co-founder and co-organizer of The Godless Perverts. You can find her at Greta Christina's blog on the Free Thought Blog Network, freethoughtblogs.com.gretachristina. 
I am so happy. I've been looking forward to this for months. Um, so this is a story from my collection, Bending, of my erotic fiction collection. Um, it's from the religion section. There's actually an entire section of religion-themed porn in this book. Um, and this is also the first piece of gay male erotica that I ever wrote. Um, and it's called The Rest Stop. So I'm gonna adjust this. Can I adjust this? No, nah, it's fine. He pulls his pickup truck into the rest stop. It's one in the morning on a weeknight. The rest stop isn't a happenstance place where he's stopping to catch some sleep before moving on. It's his destination. Nobody else is there yet, but another truck that had been behind him on the highway pulls in after him. He ducks his head, prays to God for forgiveness, then flashes his lights. A specific sequence of shorts and longs, signaling what he's here for. Signaling generally, and then more particularly, what he's here for. A sequence he now knows intimately. A sequence he sometimes has nightmares about. The truck behind him flashes back. He gets out of his truck, goes into the men's room, walks over to the metal sink. He bends over it, braces himself with his hands. He waits. He tries to pretend that he isn't here for what he's here for, that he's just pulling over at a rest stop to wash his face, and that what's about to happen will be a shock, nothing he planned for against his will. The fact that he has inserted lube into his asshole with a syringe makes his pretense impossible. He waits. The man walks in behind him. He shudders, more in fear than anticipation. He knows that the man could be dangerous. Bad things, worse than what he's already doing, could happen. Bad things have already happened. He's been hurt. Some of these men are rough, rougher than he likes. He's been torn before he learned about the lube. He's had his wallet stolen. One guy took off his belt and beat his ass with it before he fucked him. The guy must have gotten his signals wrong, or maybe he just didn't care. Maybe the guy was a genuine psycho. He stood there, bent over at the sink, and took it. He hadn't been belted since he was a kid. It hurt like the fires of judgment. Tears poured down his face as the belt landed on his ass again and again, and he gripped the sink tighter and gritted his teeth and let it happen. The man finally pushed his cock into him, and the burning pain on the skin of his ass felt clean, like it balanced out the sinful shame of the hard cock he'd invited inside. He felt like he deserved it. He felt like maybe God would have mercy on him on Judgment Day if he remembered the welts that were on his ass when this man's cock was pushing inside it. He never used to get off on pain and shame, as sick as he was, as sick as he knows this thing is, that was never his sickness. But now, after years of getting fucked too hard in rest stop bathrooms, his body has been trained. The shame he feels about his lusts and the repulsive places he goes to fulfill them and the disgraceful, sometimes painful things he lets happen to him are now hopelessly tangled up with the lust itself. The night that he got beaten with the belt, he went on the internet afterward and looked up the headlight code for beat me first. He hasn't used it yet, but he always thinks about it. This man tonight now comes up behind him. The man sets a hand on his shoulder, warm, weirdly reassuring. Then the hands come around his waist and undo his belt and pull down his trousers and his shorts. He feels the familiar throb in his cock and the familiar shame as his ass and his cock are exposed and this thing he's doing becomes unmistakably what it is. He spreads his legs and waits. The man clears his throats. Oh, Jesus, have pity, no, a talker. Usually all this takes place in total silence, but some of them like to talk. They tell him what a slut he is. They ask him how he likes their big cocks in his pussy hole. They tell him fantasies about the disgusting, perverted things they want to do to him. He desperately wishes they wouldn't. He feels like he has no defense against their words. 
His armor is down. He is bent over a men's room sink in a filthy rest stop with his pants pulled down, getting fucked in the ass or about to get fucked, and whatever they say goes right into the core of his soul. The man speaks. God, I want you. You are so fucking hot, do you know that? Such a tight little ass and such tight wiry legs and those gorgeous hands. You are amazing. I want you so much, I can't wait to fuck you. The words are painful. The man's admiration makes him flinch more than any filthy fantasies he's had to listen to. The words make him feel like he doesn't want to think about what they make him feel like. The voice is faintly familiar. Someone from local TV or radio, maybe. It wouldn't be the first time. The voice goes on. I love how dirty this is, don't you? I love that all over the world, men are having dirty fantasies about this, and here we are actually doing it. It's so fucking hot. He feels the hands on him again. On his bare ass, squeezing and fondling, he braces himself and spreads his legs wider. But then the hands wander, down to caress his thighs, up and over to rub his shoulders, pulling his shirt up to play with his nipples and fondle his chest. He hates it when they do this. It makes him feel he doesn't want to think about it, like a faggot. The word jumps into his mind and won't be pushed back. He despises it, he struggles against it, but this man's hands are hard to resist. Strong, calloused, and at the same time intelligent and curious, exploring his body, seeking out his hot spots, lingering when they find a good one, and then teasing away to search for another. He shudders. He normally just stands still and silent and lets himself get fucked, but he can't help it. He begins to moan and to squirm. God help him, he wants this so much. God, I want you, the man says, say it. He shakes his head, he can't. He'll come here, he'll flash the lights, he'll bend over the sink and offer his ass to be fucked, but he can't say out loud that he wants it. If he does, he'll be lost. The man's fingers toy at the opening of his asshole, teasing, lingering, making him squirm and buck. Come on, say it. He feels like he's drowning. He clutches on to the last shreds of his soul, keeping him afloat. The man's fingers are circling his asshole, widening the rip in his life raft, pulling him down. He struggles and sinks. Please, he says, yes, I want you. A finger goes in, not even an inch, then pulls out again. You want me to what? Say it. Tell me what you want me to do. His mouth is dry. I want you to fuck me. The finger goes in deeper. A second one joins it. Say it again. Keep talking. Tell me that you want me. Tell me what you want me to do. He's falling now, and the momentum of his fall makes every word come easier. Please, he says, please, keep fingering me, and then fuck me in the ass. Please, slide your hard cock into my asshole. God, I want your cock in me so much. Please, fuck me, make me come with your cock deep inside me. All the words he could never say out loud, all the words he could barely stand to think, he says now to this man. He knows the words are dirty, but they pour out of him like a fire hose of clean water clearing out a sewer pipe. The man fingers him and then slides his cock in, gentle and nasty. The words gushing out of him begin to mix with moans and gibberish. He reaches down as he babbles and grips his cock. He never does this. He always waits for the other guy to jerk him off, or he waits for the guy to leave and jerks himself off in the toilet alone. But now he licks his hand and strokes his cock, still begging out loud for the fucking that he's getting, matching his rhythm to the cock stroking inside him. The guy starts to talk again. 
yeah, that's right. Jerk yourself off while I fuck you. That's good. That is so right. God, I can feel you squeezing around me. God, that's, they are both gibbering now, talking over each other, their words and grunts overlapping, intertwining. He feels the man straining and then coming, the careful seductive rhythm switching to a hard frenzy deep inside him. It triggers a blown fuse in his brain. His moans rise in pitch to a wail of despair, and he comes into his hand, the man's cock still inside his ass. His cum drips off his hand onto the foul rest stop floor. The man takes his hand and squeezes, smearing the cum onto both their fingers. The man pulls out of his ass, tugs on his hand, turns him around to face him. He's never looked any of these men in the face. He looks at this one now. Fuck. He knows him. Paul, from his parish. <laughs> Paul, who see, he sees at church every Sunday. Paul, whose mother is on the church building committee with his wife, Adele. A few years younger than him, solid guy, good looking. Everyone always wondered why he didn't marry. Christ, that's why his voice sounded familiar. Merciful God, he thinks, please forgive me. Paul seems oblivious to his horror. Paul gives him a wide grin, happy and unsurprised. I saw your truck pull in, Paul says. I recognized it, but I couldn't believe it was you. I've been looking at you for so long, I never thought, my God, I so need to see you again. Not here. When can we meet? There's a motel near the city, a place I know about. They won't care. He shakes his head. This was bad enough already. He can't go any further. He can't go there to that motel with this man that he likes, with this man whose name he knows. He can't be what this man wants him to be. I'm sorry, Paul. No, I don't. I'm not a faggot. Every man who has ever fucked him here, who has said anything about it at all, has said that they're not a faggot. The man who beat his ass with a belt before he fucked him said afterwards that he wasn't a faggot. Paul strokes his cheek, looks at him with pity and compassion. Yes, you are. You're a faggot. You are a faggot, Albert. I am a faggot, and I want to see you again. I am a faggot. I am a gay man, and I want to suck your cock and play with your nipples and massage your ass until you beg me to fuck you. I want you to tell me every sexy thing you've ever thought about, and I want to do it with you. Don't, Albert, you come here. You must have been coming here for I don't know how long. You're a faggot. I'm a faggot. Who cares? When can I see you again? He'd been right. This man was dangerous. He has just been fucked in the ass, and his pants are still down, and he has no defense against Paul's words. His armor is gone. The words that Paul is saying go right into the core of his soul. He is a faggot. He reaches out to grip Paul's hair by the back of the head. He leans in and kisses him soft and deep. He can feel Paul's surprise and joy spring up in the man's body like a sapling. He clutches Paul close and presses against him, and their softening cocks rub together along with their tongues. He has been coming to this place and to places like it for 13 years. He has never kissed another man before today. He finally breaks away. Wednesdays, he says, I usually come here on Wednesdays. Tell me the name of the motel. Testing, testing, testing. Rebecca Watson leads a team of skeptical female activists at skeptic.org and appears on the weekly Skeptic's Guide to the Universe podcast. She travels around the world delivering entertaining talks on science, atheism, feminism, and skepticism. There is currently an asteroid orbiting the sun with her name on it. Please welcome Rebecca Watson. Woo! Hello. 
This is a true story, first of the evening. Um, <clears throat> so it was the beginning of the summer, and so I went to buy a guitar, as you do. And the boy who sold me the guitar, who will henceforth be known as Reginald, It's not his name, but there's a certain air of <laughs> royalty about it. Um, <clears throat> just seems nice, seems nice to do. Uh, Reginald was pleasing to my eye, and apparently I to his. And we exchanged phone numbers and went our separate ways, and he called me a short time after that, and we decided to go out. So we went out. Uh, to a bar, and I, as I usually do in these sort of situations, I went up to the bar and I ordered one of everything. <laughs> and Reginald ordered one glass of water. So that was odd, but that's okay. I'm not going to ask because I always assume that people who don't drink alcohol have some horrific thing in their past. <laughs> that has caused that to happen, and it's not good date material. So I let it slide, and we uh, sit down and we start having conversation, and he's great. He's kind, and he's thoughtful, and it's, it's almost astonishing that he's, he's so good looking and so nice, and, and he doesn't drink. And eventually all of those puzzle pieces fall into place when he tells me he is an ex-Mormon. Of course you are. Uh, he has 8,000 siblings. <laughs> and uh, he, he's just got that Mormon look about him. It all just comes together. But he's ex, so it's fine. We're still on the same page. And as things do, the, one thing leads to another, leads to another. And I've got him back in my apartment and uh, things are getting, getting sexual in nature. <laughs> Refer to the previous few <laughs> uh, speakers. And um, <laughs> so we are, we're in my bed and we're both naked and he looks just as good naked. I'm quite pleased. Good job, Rebecca, I tell myself. <laughs> <laughs> and we have now passed what I like to call the point of no return. <laughs> Things are happening. <laughs> it's great. So uh, I, I turn over to my side of the bed and I open the nightstand of sin. And I say, <laughs> choose your rubber. <laughs> There's a variety. Uh, I don't want to um, make assumptions. <laughs> Give you the magnum if that's not your deal and you feel inadequate. <laughs> you choose. And he looks at the nightstand of sin, and he looks at me, and he says, are you on birth control? Now, I've heard this before. <laughs> We've all heard this before. And I say, oh, sweetie, <laughs> I know it feels better for you, <laughs> but it feels better for me to not get syphilis. <laughs> so. So why don't you just pick a pony and bet it? <laughs> and he said, no, that's fine. I will wear that, but are you on birth control? And I said, well, no, I'm not. I had just moved to the city. I didn't have a doctor. I didn't have a gynecologist yet or anything. So I said, no, I, I'm, I'm not on the pill. Also, I think it kind of makes me crazier. So I, I gave it up, didn't like it. So get that on your thing and let's go to town. And he says, well, can you get birth control? <laughs> and I said, I think maybe we're talking about different things. <laughs> uh, are you referring to a pill that I take every day and it controls my hormones and then we can have sex without a condom? And he said, well, yeah, yeah, like the pill, the pill, can you get it? And I said, I can get it, but it will require me 
getting a gynecologist, going and having a full exam, getting the pres prescription, uh, taking the pill for a month, <laughs> and then we could have sex. <laughs> and he said, there's gotta be another way. <laughs> I was like, well, you could just stick the condom on your dick and fuck me. <laughs> That's an option. <laughs> And he said, I don't feel comfortable with that. I don't think that's enough. And that's when it hit me. I said, you think you have super sperm. You ex-Mormon fucker. You think it's in your genetics that the reason why you have eight million siblings is because the Mormon sperm just cannot be held back that the Mormon women try and try and try, but no. The Mormon sperm will make its way to the egg. <laughs> and you don't want to knock me up. I get it. Well, let me tell you this, Reginald. <laughs> you have human sperm. <laughs> And this spermicidal condom is going to stop it. And if it doesn't, I promise you, I will be at Planned Parenthood first thing in the morning with a gin and tonic, picking up that pill and popping it as soon as I can. I will not be having your baby. Fuck you. <laughs> and so Reginald was by nature a thoughtful person. And throughout the evening, whenever I asked him a question, he was very comfortable with silence and would, the simplest questions he would just think about. For, like, what's your, what's your favorite color? <sighs> what's your fucking favorite color? So, <laughs> so after I sort of, um, ripped into him, like there's a long silence. It went on for what seemed like several days, but was probably five minutes, I don't know, of us sitting there in bed, naked, me just glaring. And after this long silence, he turns to me and he says, okay. And I said, okay, what? And he said, okay. Let's do it. And I said, get the fuck out of my apartment. Thank you. All right, our last reader of the evening. This man is a Taurus after astrological reassignment, psychic surgery, before which he was a Camry. In numerology, he's a 9, 7, 3, or a 1, depending on which system you use. In past life, he was a sea monkey named June, who led the sea monkeys to the Great Salt Lake in Utah, where they were able to practice their religion unfettered until the Mormons showed up. <laughs> when he wears pants, he wears Wrangler Ranchers, for which he has to drive 20 miles out of town to purchase. He's the founder of the Coexist Comedy Troupe, the only chance we've got, the cat's pajamas, and the reason we can't have nice things. Please give it up for the inventor of the headlight code, Mr. Keith, 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 no, 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 Jensen! This is just so fitting, I can't. <laughs> Come on, buddy, there'll be other ladies. I know Rebecca's very nice, but... So you did to that poor Mormon? Goddamn these sex-hating feminists, am I right? Ah. Fuck. I was so worried being on this show. I was so worried, and a lot of my male friends, by which I mean other male atheists who follow me on Twitter, warned me, they warned me you can't do a show with Greta Christina and Rebecca Watson. Those feminists, they'll get to you. Don't worry about me, bros. I'm okay. The castration wasn't even that painful. <laughs> right, David? 
Due to the religion of my parents, my cock had already been altered. Fuck it, get it off of me. It's all or nothing, baby. Someone mentioned the uh, Karma Sutra, and it reminded me uh, that at the liquor store by my house, uh, they used to sell Karma Sutra incense. And it had little sexy pictures from the Karma Sutra on the incense. I always thought that was funny, because I was like, man, when I think about the Karma Sutra, I think, I like what that looks like. And, and if I think about it more, I might even think, man, I bet I would like what that sounds like. Never once did I think, fuck, I want my apartment to smell like that. <laughs> That's, make some incense out of that and send it on over. I'm gonna set that on shit on fire. That's gonna smell so good in my apartment. Mm. Here's a quick impersonation. Uh, this is um, a good percentage, I won't say every, but this is a good percentage of the conversations that I had with other men about sex in my life so far. Goddamn bitches won't give me no pussy. Oh? Uh, <laughs> why, why, why do you think that is? Because I'm too nice. Okay. Uh, good luck. <laughs> good luck with that. Appreciate it. Um, okay, so this is what I've started telling people recently when people ask how I stopped being an atheist. The story is true, uh, that it's how I stopped being an atheist isn't necessarily. <laughs> I'm such an honest person, I need this disclaimer. Oh, let me also say real quick that I was thinking during, uh, during all the talks, but particularly the one about fucking Mormon boys, uh, I was thinking what's so great about the godless pervert story hour is that when religious people think about what we do here and we're like, no, no, it's not like that. And then it's like, oh, well, sometimes, sometimes it is. Sometimes, sometimes it's just like that. That's just once in a while. It's nail on head. Uh. Um, so anyway, the story. Uh, so I went to camp. I went to a Christian camp when I was a kid. And I had a really good time at Christian camp. Uh, I, I was enjoying myself. I'm not very comfortable in the water. I like going swimming, but not around other people. So I got up early in the morning and I walked up to the swimming pool. Chance to sit in the water in the middle of these beautiful woods without any other people around. But then I got there and somebody was already at the swimming pool. And I thought, shit. And then I realized, no, they're probably like me. And if I go sit there, I'll make them uncomfortable and they'll leave and then I can have the pool to myself. So I went and I sat down showing my Christian charitable self. <laughs> I sat down and the person at the pool was a woman and she jumped in the pool and she swam across to the other side of the pool and she got out of the pool and that's when I realized that she was wearing a t-shirt and nothing else. And the t-shirt was now doing what t-shirts do when they're soaking wet. Surely you guys know about this. There's com competitions and everything. Uh, I don't know if she was in training, if she was planning on going pro. What I did know, uh, just barely teenage self, was that uh, I was now seeing a woman's body and that was incredibly, incredibly fucking pleasing and I no longer gave a shit about swimming. <laughs> she turned towards me, I thought, oh, now she sees me, this stops, and she walks right by me and she goes to the other side of the pool and she jumps in and she does it again and repeats the whole thing, and my little brain almost fucking explodes at this point, because I said, she knows what she's doing. She's doing this at this point specifically for me. She's putting on a show. She does it a third time. And I'm sorry, please remember, I was just a kid. I hate to admit this, but it was on that third time that for the first time, I looked up at her face. Sorry. When I did, I went, oh, shit, <laughs> I know her, <laughs> that's Sue. Sue was a friend of mine who was developmentally disabled. Yeah, guilt exploding in my head because all of a sudden the whole consent thing had been blown and I was a guilty neurotic kid anyway. And I was like, no, she wasn't doing that for you, you little asshole. She didn't know what the fuck she was doing and you were taking advantage of it. And I'm having this huge 
crisis. Well, most of me was. My cock was still all, yes, this is fucking great. Shut up up there, there's a naked woman. And uh, I was like, Sh you, will you fucking have a soul? I mean, come on, this is just our friend and she's disabled and quit it. Disabled doesn't mean she can't be hot, asshole. And so me and my cock are having this fight and I don't know what to do and she's continuing to swim and I'm continuing to watch so it's getting worse and worse. And then finally Kenny comes in and Kenny is one of the counselors at the church camp and I go, this is what they're here for, right? I'll go talk to Kenny and Kenny will make everything better. So I walk over and I say, hey, Kenny, good to see you. And Kenny says, oh, hey, what's up, dude? And I said, can, can I talk to you for a minute? And Kenny said, have a seat. And I had a seat. And then Kenny goes, hey, check out my knee, bro. And he had gashed his knee open skateboarding. And he hadn't taken very good care of it. And it looked awful. And I said, ugh. And he said, yeah. Hey, bro, doesn't it look like a pussy? I had a two-part response. The first part was, I don't know. <laughs> and the second part was, oh my God, I hope not. <laughs> and then Kenny, my guiding light, my mentor, did what can only be described as the world's most surreal ventriloquist act. Hello, Keith. I am Pussy Knee. Kiss me, Keith. Kiss me. I am Pussy Knee. Uh, my body was now in alignment. The erection had completely gone away. Thank you, Kenny. You were a help. And one of the female counselors came out and put a towel around my friend and let her off to explain to her uh, the importance of undergarments. And I went back to my cabin and masturbated and immediately became an atheist. Thank you guys so much. Good night. That's our show. Thank you so much for coming out. If you want to find out more about what the Godless Perverts are doing, go to godlessperverts.com. Uh, we do regular performances like this in San Francisco. We also have a social meetup. Uh, we are hoping to expand our empire to take over the known universe. Uh, so, and of course, that always starts as it always does with a website, godlessperverts.com. Check it out. And thank you so much for coming out tonight. Good night, perverts.